All right, all right. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone have a good week? Good. Rock and roll. Let's get to it. Now, we got a bunch of stuff that we need to talk about today. Uh, so let's get to it. How goes your church address? Hey, Tom. Did everyone survive the inclement weather? No. That's a little. Okay. Great. I love it. I got to do the same. <laughs> all right, all right. Okie dokie day. Um, so I'm glad to see everyone. Be careful out there over the next couple days. It is going to be rainy. And I want to make sure I see everyone back uh, here next week. Thinking of next week, it doesn't go, I mean, I'm sure I don't have to remind everyone, but Game Developers Conference. Next week, who else planning on going? Almost everyone. That's excellent. I'm really quite pleased to see that. I'm going to be down there on Wednesday. So the next time I see you guys is actually after spring break. So I won't see you. Uh, well, I'll see you next week, obviously. But then, uh, then the week after that is spring break, which is pretty exciting, right? It's so next week's Game Developers Conference, the following week's spring break. Then we come back together again in April, which is going to be kind of fun. So class is, you know, kind of normal next week. Nothing, you know, nothing's going to change for you guys. This coming Thursday? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, and I'm going down on Wednesday, okay. so none of my SCC classes are affected one way or the other. So it's kind of business as usual next week. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. If you see me on Thursday or Friday, I'll give you a full report as to what I saw at the conference on Wednesday. So, uh, for those of you that are going down, have fun. It's going to be a pretty engaging week. Um, it's going to be pretty neat. Yeah. All right. Uh, today, what I wanted to kind of spend our time is continue on, continuing our exploration of, of Substance Painter. And there's really three kind of ideas that I want to I want to galvanize and introduce to you guys today. Three little missions, if you will, goals. Okay. First and foremost, decals. How we incorporate badges and logos and text and things like that. I also want to talk about height maps and how we can paint on specific details. You know, it's kind of like a glorified bump map, if you will. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, I want to spend some time today ensuring that um, uh, we get all our textures out of Substance Painter and then into a format that we can use over in Moto to do some of our renders. Okay, So th those are our three kind of mini objectives today as we march towards the completion of our little treasure chest. Sound good? Yeah? Okay, rock and roll. Let's get to it. Um, I think what we'll do... Yeah, go ahead. Sure, absolutely. Okay. Let's see. I'm trying to, trying to see if I have something with me that I can use to quickly talk about it. Maybe in the context of something we haven't seen before. I'm just going to grab a couple files that I'm going to use later. All right. Um, bah, bah, bah. Let's do... Well, let's see. I actually have my treasure chest that I used. I don't know if this is going to be too complex of an example or not complex enough. Let's see here in a second. Okay. Because one of the things that we need to be strategic about when we're doing all of our UV maps is figuring out where all the kind of parts need to be. And really, when, I, when I'm UV mapping, I try to take the perspective of a craftsperson that's making this object. It, it gets a little, bit, a little bit easier, right? It's like, okay, this is going to be metal. It's going to be bent around this section. You know, it's going to be bent to make the top. Maybe there's a metal frame in there, too. How do we flush this out? in the UV space to give us the ability to texture what we need to texture quickly over inside, uh, inside of Painter. Let's do it real fast. Um, bum, 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 bum. When, when you use these now, then, like if you have two different mesh or two yeah. different mesh, do all the mesh have to be on one, um, one mesh? I mean, I'm trying to say it, but for like, what I'm saying. Like if I got the top and the bottom, yeah. Have yep. On their own, own, own mesh item. Own mesh item. Yep. Do they both have to be on one item before you use it? Well, that's a good question. No, they, uh, when, you can have them on separate items when you're UV mapping. 
Yeah. Right? Because the UVs are always going to follow the polygons. Okay. Once the geometry is UV'd, the only way to separate them is to physically go into your UV tools and say delete UVs. Okay. okay? So wherever we copy and paste or cut and paste those mesh items in the future, the UVs are going to come along for the trip. Okay. Which is why UV mapping in my in my mind is is kind of a good thing. Um, because once it's done, it's done, right? You only have to do it once if you do it correctly the first time or as, as good as you can the first time. Right. All right. Let me, um, ba, 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 ba. let me see. I have no idea if this is going to work, but let's just give it a go. Let's see. I have, I am firing in the dark. I really don't know. How complex? Okay, so pretty complex. So here's the project file for the treasure chest that I made a while ago, right? And this is a pretty early one. It's, I don't think this one's done, but let's just go over into our UV edit layout and start exploring how how I chose to put some of this stuff together. Okay, and I'm gonna go and turn off my set. Yep, there we go. Okay, cool. Don't need my locator. And inside, let's turn off all the treasure. Okay, so I have the top and the bottom. Now, this particular one um, is a subdivision surface, okay? But the UV, the UV mapping tool set is identical, right? There is no difference on, on, that, on that regard. So let's just look at the tops right here. And, and I chose to do this. Oh, this is not the packed one. This is, yeah, this, yeah. This is the one that was, yeah. Okay, this is a bad one. However, actually, let's do this. I'm going to create a new map. <laughs> and we can take a look at it, right? Because a lot of this is just strategy. How do we go from point A to point B reasonably? Okay. What is our approach to all this? So this is my treasure chest. Okay. It's pretty simple. In all honesty, uh, I was inspired. I think at the time that I was making this, my eldest son was two. So this is three or so years ago. And I was inspired by Jake and the Neverland Pirates. Does anyone know that television show? If you don't know that television show, it's okay because you're adults and there's no reason that you should know that show. Uh, <laughs> but it is a, you know, a, a Disney Junior cartoon series uh, all about, you know, Neverland and Captain Hook and all that. Anyways, this is a treasure chest that was inspired by one of the treasure chests in that realm. So this is what I have. Pretty neat little shape. So let's talk about how I chose... To unwrap this and let's just start with the base okay because there are some details some hinges and things so this is just the raw the raw shape and let's unsubdivide it so we can take a look at what we're working with here so here's the raw geometry okay and uh, kind of going back to what I was talking about earlier I think an easy way of getting us to that end result is to think in uh, think as a craftsman okay if you were the person charged with making this okay you know, in my mind, this is a metal frame on this side, okay? And then these things in here, these are all wood panels, okay? So where would the natural seams be in between these two physical uh, objects out there in the real world? That's a good place to put a seam. And that's a good place to start our exploration of how to unwrap all this stuff, okay? So uh, let's see. I know all of this jazz in here. This is supposed to be wood, okay? So, um, and as a suggestion, life gets easy UV mapping if you isolate, okay? It gets really confusing and extraordinarily fast if you're trying to unwrap and create all these pieces with a tremendous amount of geometry on uh, initially. So, be a, a steward of your mental health, okay? And uh, honestly... Yeah. We're not good stewards of our mental health. We're yeah, be better stewards of your mental health, okay? It's really... Really kind of helpful. I was gonna say, but we're in college. Yeah. All right. So there it is. Oops, missed a couple. So there's the piece that I want to work with. Okay. And I'm literally just gonna do Shift H to hide everything else. And then once things are starting to get isolated we can kind of start to see some of these pieces unfold, literally unfold right in front of us. So this is an easy one, right? That's just an unwrap. Okay. And let's see, I have my method set to conformal, my iterations at 1049. Okay. 
And that's a pretty decent UV island, but it's not perfect in any sense. And I think I can make it better. Now the things in here that are saying not perfect to me is really the relationship of this center line to the rest of the piece. Okay. Just visually looking at it, you can see that, you know, that's, you know, the front side. Here's the back. Okay. I know that when I created this model, it's a symmetrical shape along two of the three axes, right? So symmetrical along the Z and on the X, okay? That UV island is nowhere close to being symmetrical across the entirety of its, of its shape. So my next natural thought process is, is to run relax. The relax tool in the UV edit layout is kind of like a gigantic iron, right? It takes sometimes malformed UV islands and it starts to compare the island back to the original geometry on the mesh. And it's going to start to push and, and move your, your UVs around a little bit to hopefully give you a good result. Okay? Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work in that particular sense. It didn't do a whole lot. Um, let's try conformal. Conformal stretched it a little bit, but you know, I think I may have to just keep going with it. Now, if I really wanted to get super nerdy about it, Maybe I divide this in half, okay, okay, and run the unwrap tool on both of these pieces separately. Sometimes that gives you the a better result, and then experiment with you know putting them back together. Now I'm using move and sew here. Selected this edge. You can see over here. The purple ones are that same edge, okay, along the top. Then over in our move and sew tools, if you hold down the option key, it tells you how it's going to sew all these together, okay? If you hold down shift, the selected edges are going to stay where they are, and the unselected, so the purple ones, are going to be moved and combined or connected to the selected island, okay? And that's actually what I want. Boop, okay? And I think that's probably about as good as I'm going to get. Okay. Yeah, that's not that's not so bad. And if you look at it, it's looking generally symmetrical. Generally symmetrical. I think at this point I'm ready to move on. Okay. Let's unhide the rest of the mesh and continue working. Okay. Now I did the exact same thing over here. Now maybe for the frame. Okay. The frame. There's a lot of geometry in here. Like I said, this is not the game asset. This is the, uh, you know, subdivision surface asset. So there's a lot of interior stuff in here. That's holding forms, and naturally that, that wouldn't be included in a game asset. But the ideas are the same. You can start stripping out a lot of this interior loop geometry and get, get it down to a real-time asset pretty quickly, in all honesty. Okay, so once again, I'm going to isolate. I'm going to work on maybe just this one here. Sometimes selecting the big pieces... And then hiding them is a whole lot easier than the alternative. So you just take a piece at a time. A piece at a time. Yeah. Here's a great little trick. Okay. On a row like this, the loop select is not going to give me what I want. It's going to select a much larger chunk. Okay. It's going to select the actual loop, which goes around the entirety of that of that middle pane, which I don't really want. What I'm trying to grab is just this center loop right here. Here's a great little selection trick for working inside of Moto is the shift right click. So if I grab one, okay, that one right there. Now I'm gonna hold down the shift key and I'm gonna right click on this one. And it's, at time, it's, it's gonna gang select, it's gonna select everything in between. And at times it works really well, other times it doesn't work so hot. But it's a great way, shift right click, yeah, on that specific one, it did a great job of, of doing what I want it to do. All right, so I'm thinking in pieces now. Where do I want this piece to end? Well, if I was a craftsperson making this metal frame, I'd probably start with something with square stock, okay? So this would be, you know, you'd have a joint right here in the metal. Like this whole piece right here is one metal, metal you know, kind of stock. Okay, this thing is going to be it's, you know, the, the part that goes up and over uh, up and over the treasure chest. That's going to be its own part. So, you know, you can go in 
and start to explore this stuff. And I, and I really encourage you to explore. I really don't have the answers. I just have strategies. Okay, my strategy is to find the natural seams, natural seams and things, and then go from there. I think the Moto UV Mapping Toolkit works the best when we isolate. Yeah, I want to make my life a little so, bit easier. Last question. Yeah. Um, okay, you just UV map one piece. Mm -hmm. and I can to another. How did you clear the UV mapping part to where you can do that? Otherwise, you're not. That the milk piece you, you had UV mapped already, right? Yeah, I hit it. I just selected it and hit the H key. Okay. And then it just then it clears up the other panel right there? The UV? It does, yeah. Okay. Yep. It does. It does indeed. All right. So I'm just trying to find logical pieces here, and this is the only one that I'm going to do. Okay. <clears throat> How do you unselect a single polygon? Hold, to get hold down the control key and click on it. Let's see. Now, as you get more experience and you start to see the matrix, as they say, see the code in the matrix, you won't have to hide and unhide as much of this stuff, right? You'll be able to just to, to see pretty quickly the natural locations for all your seams. So it gets it gets better and a whole lot faster with more experience. So it's not always going to be like this. I remember when I first started doing this, I dreaded UV mapping. It was one of the things I was like, "Oh my goodness, are you serious? This is what I got to do." <laughs> all right, and I just really honestly hated it. Okay, uh, but now I can't live without it. It really has become an invaluable tool for me as I unwrap all these shapes. Oops, looks like I forgot one. So shift H to hide everything else. And there it is, okay? So that's gonna be a piece. Oops, looks like I forgot. So you take each individual piece. Yeah. No matter how complex it is, just take one piece at a time. You got it, just one piece at a time. Is The more methodical you can be in this process, the easier it becomes. Okay. If you try to do, if you try to unwrap everything all at once, it's, it's impossible, right? And you're going to confuse yourself, and the results are going to be pretty poor. So really quick, so 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 after you take all the pieces, so you're making a this own, you put it in this own mesh on the UV maps, like went under a list. Yep. The list tab. You got it. Okay. And so so ignore these. These are just those are garbage ones. This is the one that I'm currently working on. Right. So when I'm done, I'd go back in and delete these other two. Okay. Yep. So, so for, for example, that one would be called frame, another one would be called base. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. I would have everything on one UV map. Okay. Yeah, so if I was to, as an example, as I, as I unhide the rest of my geometry, so here's an island there, I'm about to create another island, so you're going to have a whole bunch of islands all in one. Oh, okay. Yeah. And yeah. Whichever one you highlight is going to already have its own UV. Well, not highlight, but like you did right here. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay. Yep. So you're about to take that, that piece right there. You got it. You're just going to hit unwrap. I'm going just going to hit unwrap. To yep. And well, let's just see what it gives me. Okay? okay. I always try as is first. Sometimes you get lucky. And I'm okay with luck. And I think I got pretty lucky. We're not seeing anything in here. That's too objectionable. The only way to know for sure is to put that check pattern on. Okay? So um, here's a cool thing. These viewport textures are pretty great. Because one of the problems that we have uh, is that, you know, just managing and importing in uh, a checker pattern or a grid and assigning it to the right UV map and all that jazz and texture locator work. I mean, that's all well and good, but sometimes you just want to see if it works. These viewport textures allow us to insert a texture map into our viewport without having to create a texture locator. Think of them kind of like as temporary textures, something that's really kind of purpose-built for, for what we're doing, just testing. Let's just UV textures. Look at the little popover. This is looking into your asset library. Here's the checker pattern that I like. I'm just going to double click on it. And you can see that it's put it on there. This is just a temporary thing. It won't render. It's just for this one viewport. It's a great way just to get something in, see if it's working, and then move on. You can test that it's working. I rotate my UVs. It rotates over there.
Now, what am I looking for in the in the in the checker pattern inside of my viewport? Stretching. Stretching. I'm looking for really objectionable distortions in the image that's showing up on the mesh. So if the grid squares on the checker pattern are starting to go in, a, in an S curve, or the letters are pinching and distorting oddly, that's a stop. Rewind and re, you know, we've got to examine exactly how our UVs um, are being used. Okay, and at times it's just a, it's more often than not you'll just have to go in and and re-UV that one area that's causing the problems, okay? But I encourage you to use these viewport textures, okay? They're really helpful. They make testing UVs especially very, very quick and easy. So yeah. Just hit the enable button at the top. Oh. Now it's on. Now it's off. I wish yep. That's a good one. It's a good little trick. Now, as you get through to this, and let's just see, I may actually have the finished one. With everything all laid out. Uh oh. Here we go. So I'm not sure if this particular one. Yeah, here we go. So there's all my UVs for the top. Okay. They're all laid out, packed in there. So this is this is most likely what you're gonna see. For years is a whole bunch of individual pieces. Okay. Now for this one, you know, here's the bottom. Okay. Every polygon gets UV mapped. Okay. And that way we can bring it over into Substance Painter and do our work. How many polygons is that just? Oh, I have no idea. Let's find out. I really don't know. Like I said, this is this was made for something else. It is eleven thousand polygons. <laughs> And that's just for the chest itself. You add in treasure, all that jazz in the background. It gets, a, gets to be a pretty neat scene pretty quickly. All right. That help, Grant? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Rock and roll. Okay. I'm going to go back and look at the YouTube video. Good. All right. So, one of the things that I wanted to do today in the context of Substance Painters talk about decals. Okay, how we can bring in a logo or some sort of outside image and paint that, incorporate that into our texture pipeline. It's really, really easy. Okay, however, there are some small little differences that we need to be made aware. Okay, and let's see if this even works. I just grabbed something. All right, let's just see if this works. I have no idea if this is even going to work. All right. So what I have here, I want to put our city logo, city college logo, on top of the crate that we've been working with over in Substance Painter. Right? Uh, there are some considerations that we need to kind of practice and follow um, in this process. I think for, for me, what I'm going to do just real quickly here is try to get it into uh, a more complete shape. At the moment, this is just a path hanging out here in Photoshop. So uh, let me just make a solid out of this thing. See if that works. It's nice and red. Ah, it's backwards. Here we go. Oh. Hmm. There we go. Now I control it. That's all that. Okay, great. So there it is. That's our City College logo. Not our City College colors. I'll leave it this bright, awesome red because uh, it, it gets pretty fun pretty quickly. Now, there's some things in here that we need to consider. Okay, I'm actually going to save this out as... Well, actually, I'll, I'll do this. One of the things that we, that we like to do when we're working with outside textures is ensure that they follow a square texture format as much as we can. So I'm going to create a new Photoshop document, and you can literally do this in Illustrator, Photoshop, any image editing application out there uh, that you're comfortable with. It, it doesn't really honestly matter. 
uh, but I'm going to follow a square image format, 1024 by 1024. Here we go. And I'm going to take, see that's my garbage layer, don't save. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to take this layer, put it in another document. Now, I like doing this because it ensures that the file that we create is square. And I've noticed that most applications, whether it be Moto, any of the Substance apps, they like import textures or input textures to be square, or the outside frame dimensions to be 1024 by 1024. Most of our computer graphics pipeline is built around square images. It, things you know, kind of derail pretty quickly once we start feeding them non-square images. It's not impossible, but the most efficient way of working is a square image. So this is a 1024 by 1024 texture, and I want to bring this guy in. I'm um, even have the transparency on, which would be kind of fun. And I want to bring this guy in into Substance Painter and then paint this on top of that little crate that we've been working with over the last couple of weeks. Okay. I'm a big fan of the PNG file format. That's my guy. I'm in the wrong one, excuse me. Let's just do uh, export as PNG. SCC logo. There it is, popped into my desktop. I'm really happy with that. It has the transparency in the background, which is something that I'm attracted to. And now we can fire up good old Substance Painter and get to work here. This is where we'll be spending the rest of our afternoon. What we're ultimately going to create here in Substance Painter is called a stencil. Let's reboot our system here. Start our file again. Oops. Cancel. I hit the wrong button. I went to do File New. Let's select the mesh. Oops. Actually, hold on a sec. I apologize. Looks like I deleted it or someone deleted it from. Yeah. Okay. Let me re-download the file real fast from Canvas. Thought I was sitting on my desktop. I was absolutely wrong. Okay, there it is. Luckily, it's real small. Okay, now we can start start doing our thing. On OpenGL, I want to do a 2K texture. Then we'll hit OK. And there it is. All right, so going back to uh, what we've been talking about over the last couple weeks, what's the first thing that we should do once we start a new project file here in Substance Painter? Bake the textures. Bake the textures, bake all the mesh maps, right? Now, where are we going inside of our interface to do that? Uh, texture set settings. Yeah, texture set settings, okay. I was looking for it. Yeah, all the tabs are down here at the bottom. And here it is, bake textures. That's the part of the interface that we're going towards, okay? In addition, I always like to change the output size under the common parameters section to match the texture set size that I'm working with, which is 1024. And uh, while we're here, let's just increase our ambient occlusion raise to 128. And we're off and running. Okay, This is the first thing that I do. Because these mesh maps, uh, they, they really have um, a big impact, or they can have a big impact on what we do going forward in the future. If we return to what we talked about last week, how do we use these mesh maps? Does anyone remember? What was the driver? And specifically, smart masks, right? The masking system inside of Substance Painter by default allows us to go in and customize what's getting you know, the uh, texture information from which group. Okay? But smart masks use the, the information that we just baked. Okay? So all of this jazz, there's the world space normal, Specifically, the ambient occlusion is an important one. A lot of the, uh, the smart masks and smart materials 
use these uh, this ambient occlusion and even the the curvature stuff. Oops, wrong one. Um, yeah, the curvature one is is really really popular as well. Often used in masks and in uh, smart materials. So it's good to have that stuff kind of done and, and baked in before we get started, right? Now that I have that kind of uh, up and running, let's start talking for a second uh, how we're going to use our SCC logo, okay? Because I want to be able to go in and incorporate this SCC logo as part of my design, okay? I want to be able to paint it in. Well, what's the first thing that we probably should look to do inside of Substance Painter if I want to paint that SCC logo into my project or onto my crate? I think this is an officially branded crate. Don't need to mask it yet. We need to import. We need to get it into the system itself, right? Yeah, so easy it's hard, but that's okay. If we go into our shelf, there's a couple ways that we can do this, okay? Naturally, this button right here, the little arrow inside of our shelf kind of controls, is going to determine, it's going to open up our import resources dialog box. This is an excellent place to begin, okay? So we'll choose Add Resource, and now we're just navigating to where we saved the file. There it is. Now, what we, in addition, we also need to assign it a role. We don't want to leave it undefined. By assigning it a role, uh, it allows our library to search by this role type. It puts it in the right section inside of our library, so it's a good thing to kind of establish pretty early on. In future versions of Substance Painter, and remember, we're working on the old version. In the 2017 series, uh, this list has been more refined. And there's actually like material, smart material, texture. They're continuing to work on it in a pretty big way to make sure that this, these roles have meaning inside of the library itself. So I'm going to just do texture. Now the other thing that we need to be very mindful of is where this file is going to be saved. Okay, that's when, what's under here. Import your resource to uh, the current session, which is just the current instance of this version or uh, this moment of Substance Painter. I can't imagine why you'd only ever want to do that. If we did to project, where is this going to be saved? Yeah, no, you're in the right ballpark, Charlie. Keep going. Yeah, or it is in the Substance Painter project file. It's going to be part of the resources that are included inside of your SPP. Okay. The alternative is this last one, which is the computer. Okay. The last one on the list is your local shelf. So if you're incorporating textures into your work, I would really recommend that you do it on the project. That way, whenever you go from here to home or the design lab, all of your, all of your assets follow the project file, not the computer shelf location. Okay. Then we'll hit import. And then our library takes over. Ah, look, there it is. Just chilling. Now, if we were to go into the project tab of our library, here are all the mesh maps that we painted, and there's our, our SCC logo in, the, uh, in that section of our library as well. If you think about the library, the library is just one gigantic folder, folder of stuff, okay? All the keywords, and these really just are kind of like search parameters over here, begin to filter this mega folder into a whole series of subfolders, okay? The guys and guys, the guys and gals down at Algorithmic have done an excellent job. There's a there's a video that they've produced um, on their YouTube channel that talks about how to wrangle your shelf a little bit more directly and create user search parameters. And you know, it's it's a good video, a deep dive, if you will, on how the shelf works. So I definitely encourage you to check that out if you're interested. All right, so we'll go back into our project tab, and there it is. These are all the texture maps that we just baked a moment ago. And then this is the imported SCC logo that I imported just a second, a second ago. Okay, so how are we going to use this, right? Well, there's a couple different ways that we can use this thing. Now, I'm a big believer that we should always be, uh, always be producing a structure, a framework that allows us the most control going forward. I am a control freak, okay? And I want to be able to change my mind. <laughs> I want to be able to art direct tomorrow, okay? And I want to be able to produce a layer structure inside of my project file that allows an art director to come in after I'm done creating this texture and make changes, because that's always, always, always going to happen, right? So it's important that we're creating a flexible, a flexible pipeline that allows for this change. So we've got to be careful with this. And let me show you how we're going to use 
uh, these little stencils, okay? Now, at the at its most rudimentary kind of low level, if you will, these are how stencils work, okay? Now, we've been talking a lot about the paint bucket, the fill layers over the last couple weeks, and I think they're the most valuable part of the texture paint workflow, but they're not the only player in this space, okay? We can also just have what's called a regular paint layer, and these paint layers are kind of what you see is what you get, okay? They're kind of a fire and forget layer. You don't get a lot of control over over what you've painted after the fact. Let me show you specifically what I'm talking about. Uh, so I'm working on my layer. Here's all of my paint layer properties. Let's just change this to, oh, I don't know, a lovely shade of purple. Why not? And then I got my, my paintbrush going, and I can just paint on top of this, okay? Doo -doo -doo. Pretty awesome. Life is good. Go in here, change the color. Going crazy, right? Whole lot of fun. Fire and forget though. What if I want to go in and change the yellow to a different color? What if my art director comes in and says, Pat, I love the purple, but really it should be blue, right? Because that's gonna happen. It's gonna happen very frequently. With these paint layers, you really can't do that, right? It is absolutely a fire and forget mentality. I can't go in and say, you know, uh, there's nothing over here. There's no paint bucket. There's no global material for me to change. It's like, oh, you want it to be blue? Okay, let me, you know, kind of, I don't know, erase this real fast. You know, and then make it blue. Okay, and repaint it. I don't, I don't like that, right? There is a function for them. They do have a value. And I think the value for me are stencils, right? Things that already come pre-built with a color, like a logo or a badge, that we're not going to change the color here inside of Substance Painter. Maybe it's determined by some sort of external source, like kind of our school logo for the you know for that matter. Here, I'm gonna go back in time, get rid of all my crazy strokes, okay? And let's look at how we can work uh, inside of these stencils because they're really really fun and they're incredibly easy to use, okay? The first thing that we need to change uh, is our tool. Now up here at our toolbar, of course we have our paintbrush. Here's our eraser. This is the projection tool. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. The, the, poly, the polygon fill tool. We've been using that often and a lot. But it's this projection tool that really gives us the control that we're after, right? Because now we can load in an image and, and paint on top of it, okay? So where we're going here, and let me see if I can make this easy for you guys. We need to load in that image into the base color well of my material, okay? So I wanna drag my logo right here. Bloop. Okay, cool, huh? You can start to see the method to my madness. Now it's gigantic, okay? Uh, however, maybe I zoom in, oh, that's a little too difficult, right? But where I paint, you can see what we get. Okay, cool, right? Let's hit undo and talk about how we can control this. Because really, you know, I want to be able to rotate my model, maybe something like that. Okay, and then I want to, I want my logo to maybe be just the size of this inset. So here's how we change it. And it's a hidden keyboard shortcut. I wish that they would do a better job of communicating this outside of looking through the documentation. It's so easy. It's hard. Okay, and I remember when I was first learning this, I went, how do I change the size of my stencil, right? You hold on the S key. <laughs> S for stencil, okay? Uh, once you hold down the S key, your viewport navigation controls will allow you to go in. So I'm holding down the S key now. Of course, middle mouse button will allow us to pan. Right mouse button will allow us to zoom in, make it smaller, okay? Maybe, now I'm kind of looking at the mesh behind it now, and I'm sizing up my logo where I want it to be. And now I can just kind of do, 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 go in and paint down my logo, which is a bit of tremendous amount of fun. I'm sorry, say again? If it's too large, hold down the S key and, and click and drag with your, um, with your right mouse button. Uh huh. And what if you want it bigger? And you're saying, okay, I don't want this one. It's too small. Let me make it bigger. 
the logo itself bigger? The logo itself. Okay, so let's go to the different side. I'm gonna just so you guys can see what's going on. There it is. Okay. Oops. Okay. And actually did a true projection painting. And we get That's some so stretching cool. in there. Okay. It's as if someone spray painted this logo onto the side of our crate. Okay. Now Grant's question was, how do I make it smaller? Okay, let's do it on the same thing on the different on the other side. Well, like, say if you, like, if you took that yellow stripe off of the logo, mm -hmm. how did you do that? That, I, hit, I think I just hit undo. Yeah, this yellow stripe is the current settings of my paintbrush tool. So it has asking, nothing to do with my, my logo at all. Um, I think what he's asking is after you've already applied these. Yeah, and that's the problem, right? And this is the big deal. This is the big problem with what we're working with right now, right? right. Is that these paint layers are kind of fire and forget. They're very much like a coloring book, right? And once you color, you can't erase with your crayons, right? Yeah, or the only way to change it is to either erase or to draw it again, right? You can't go in and tweak things after the fact, which turns into a gigantic problem for us, or it can turn into a gigantic problem. Uh, so as a reminder, and this is the, the part that, that folks miss, okay? We gotta go into the projection paint tool, projection tool, this guy, right here. Okay, and then you have to load it into your base color, okay? In all honesty, you can actually load this into any number of the, uh, of the channels. So if I just wanted to influence the roughness, that's kind of cool. Let's do that. That's kind of fun. Same concepts. It's kind of hard to do with this particular one. Let's do this. Okay. I want to make a fill layer. I'm going to put it below my logo, right? And on that fill layer, let's make it, I don't know, a lovely shade of complementary blue to our very red logo. Okay. In addition, uh, maybe, this will be fun, maybe I want to have, this will be cool, let's do this, I'm getting crazy here, maybe I want to have a whole bunch of SCC logos on this top rung, but I don't want it to paint it in, I want it to affect the roughness channel, so how, how, uh, how, how shiny, if you will, this surface is, so we can paint roughness too, okay, so I'm still going to fire off the projection paint tool, oops, Try that again. Oh, I'm gonna fill layer, which is why it's not working. Yeah, you can't paint fill layers, which is why all my tools have been uh, zeroed out. So let's go back for a second here and uh, drag it into roughness here. There we go. Oops, wrong button, I'm sorry. I do that often. And of course the middle mouse button, you can't really see it. Yeah, this image isn't really set up for this because it's a it's a color image, not black and white. So let's just return to our color example. There we go. So holding down the S key, left clicking and dragging to make it smaller. You can either move the mesh behind it, or you can move the logo. Whichever one that you want. How does the phrase go half a half dozen to another? Six to one, half a dozen to another? Gotcha. There it is. We can go ahead and paint that in. Is there a way for us to um, change the brush? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to change the brush properties, it's this section, right? These colored headers help us kind of separate all this stuff out. So if you want to go in and change your brush settings, you certainly can do that. Right now, I'm just using a soft shape. You know, there's any number of brush shapes that you can use uh, to give you some really fun results. So the brush setting is under materials. Uh, it's not under materials. So you have two different headers, oh, right? Bro, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got bad eyes. I yep, it's all good. Adrian. Um, is there a way to hide the stuff? Yes, there is. Uh, let's see. Trying to remember. Is it a property? It Maybe a substance preference? I can't remember. Off the top of my head, I never do it. Oh wait, but it is it is in there somewhere. Yeah, I I never do that, but I remember stumbling upon that at one point. Maybe it is part of display settings. It is not. It's probably under viewer settings, stencil opacity. It's right there. Yeah, you can just turn that down to zero, and now you can just paint until your heart's content. 
So yeah. Maybe we can change our view of the, of the model, like how modes are good. Like an orthographic view? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want, let me get out of projection painting. Okay. So here we are, kind of a three-quarter shot. Yeah. Okay. If you want to see it from like the side, as you rotate around, hold down the shift key and it'll snap. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. So um you want you want control over turning off and on that particular stencil you just put on the, the box here. So yeah. what what time of what what mask are you gonna put on to control it? So Frank's reading my notes. Okay. <laughs> this is a this is a good first step, right? And this projection painting system is really kind of powerful. However, I want to be able to control it a little bit more directly, right? I want to be able to control exactly the color reproduction as it shows up on the actual texture set, set itself. In addition, we want to create a flexible layer stack so that when, when and if there's a change, you can make that change quickly, okay? So here's a better way of working with decals and stencils, okay? I'm going to go back over to Photoshop, okay? And this time, I'm not going to have a transparent image. I want to make a mask, okay? I want to create a black and white version of my logo so that over in Substance Painter, I can use this to drive a mask. So let's make the foreground color white. Make my background color Oops. There we go. That's it. A black and white version of the exact same logo. Okay. I'm going to save this out again. Now I'm going to call this SEC Mask. There we go. And once again, I want to import it in. Earlier, we were using this little arrow button to import in a resource. That's not the only way you can do this. Okay. I'm a big believer of drag and drop. So here's my mask. I'm going to drag and drop that into my find, or into my shelf down here or my library. Look at that exact same import resource dialog box that we saw before. Okay, awesome. And now we're in a very similar workspace. Okay, but let me show you how this is going to work now. Instead of painting on a paint layer as we have here, the better way to work is to maybe paint on a fill layer. Okay. A fill layer is an excellent, excellent place to go in and continue to craft a more complex and I think a more accurate um, decal of what we're working with here. So I'm going to create a fill layer. And let's just call this logo. Here we go. Now, how do I mask out this layer? Because it's flooded this my entire my entire thing with the color, right? See, everything's red. How do I mask it out? How do I mask this paint layer, this fill layer, excuse me? Right click, add a black mask, okay? All right, since I want to paint inside of this, okay, what's next? As a reminder, there's different effects that we can do on a mask itself. I know I have the mask selected because it's got the little blue outline around it. So if I right click on my mask, I'll get this contextual menu. And down towards the bottom, there's a couple things in here that we should look at. Okay, We can add a fill layer, which will flood our mask with color information. I want to add a paint layer. Now if you go back to last week, why do we add these paint layers? Or what's the reasoning, the rationale behind them? Because by default, if I just have, the, if I just have my mask selected, I can paint and I get red, right? I know that I'm painting on the mask because anytime I change the color of that fill layer, that updates, right? Why am I choosing to add a paint layer versus just painting on the mask itself? So you have to like, you can change it anytime I want. So I can change it anytime I want, right? I get flexibility inside of my texture pipeline. The whole idea behind this is that we're not locking the pixels, okay? They are, they are editable at any stage, even at the 11th hour. Okay, because it's not if there's going to be a change, it's when there's going to be a change. Okay, there are always changes. Even within sort of our own artistic process, we want to be able to create a, a system that allows us to change our minds. I can't tell you how many times I've made something that I come back to it the next day and I go, 
Now, what was I thinking? That doesn't work at all, right? Um, this system allows us to you know, make those changes quickly without having to repaint the entire thing. All right, so I'm going to right-click and add a paint layer. Okay. Now, now that we have a paint layer, of course, once again, we can just kind of left-click and drag. But all of those paint strokes are now preserved inside of this paint section of my mask. And I can either turn it off, okay, turn it on and off, which is kind of cool. I can also go in, lower the opacity of that. You can see that now we're feathering it. We just get control, a lot of control after the stroke has been completed. All right. So I'm going to go in and uh, let me just get rid. I'm going to paint black where I just painted white. All right. So now I'm going to paint white. But once again, let's turn on our projection paint tool. But this time, I'm going to drag my black and white guy over there. Not my color guy, my black and white guy. The color one may work, but what it's going to do, it's going to flip that color image into grayscale. And depending on its conversion, that red is probably going to turn into a gray. Okay? So this is why having a black and white version of our mask or of our logo is probably a little bit of a superior workflow. Oh, that's... Yeah, it, it's, you know... When you're the one driving, it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. It's weird when you're watching someone else do it. Oops, excuse me. I just fired off the Moto keyboard shortcuts. So what I'm doing here is just getting my get my crate where I want it to be. Now holding down the S key, I'll put the mask where I want it to be. There we go. And I want to paint. So I get relatively the exact same effect. But the only difference now is I'm in control. I'm in control of the color of this. There we go. Just a real quick, real quick guy. Wait, and you weren't in control of the color before? No. The last, time? the last time we did this, the color was coming from the actual image itself. So I had no choice for it to be red, oh. okay? Because that was part of the actual decal. It's like a sticker almost, right? Now that I'm using this black and white version and a mask, I can make this logo whatever color I want, right? Because really all that I'm doing is masking out a fill layer, right? So if my art director comes in and says, Pat, that's the wrong color red, I can go, don't go anywhere, let's pick a red together. Okay, I don't have to repaint anything. Don't take two steps away and maybe I'll make it, you know, green. You know, whatever I want, okay? It just gives us control of things after we've painted all, all of our pixels, okay? It's a really great, really great workflow. Can't recommend it enough. In addition, and this is one of the things that we were unable to do last time, is that we can use these projections uh, to go in and affect other channels inside of our inside of our system. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay, and this is a, a tremendous amount of fun. Let's see if I can set it up real quickly in in a way that makes sense. Actually, with all of this interior detail, it's going to be very difficult to see. But uh, we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try. We'll do it up here at the top. Okay. I want to make a new fill layer. And like I did earlier, I want to make it blue. Just so it's really obvious. Pretty easy to see what's going on. There we go. Awesome. As I scrub around, you can see the specular highlight falling into the top there. Excellent. Me like you very much. Okay. But now let's go in and start establishing... Um, a little bit more on some of these color, uh, some of our our channels over here, because right now it's really just blue. Of course, our roughness slider is determining our some of our surface characteristics. Now it's very very shiny, a roughness value of zero. If I put it up to like you know 0.4 ish, it starts to blur out the reflections of my scene quite nicely. 
maybe what I want is I want to be able to go in and paint like an area uh, on on my crate in the SCC logo that's like just like 100% reflective. That'd be kind of fun, right? That might be kind of neat. Let's see if we can figure that part out, right? Um, all right. Let's do it. Now, what we're going to have to kind of roll with here, let's add a mask, okay? And let's see. Actually, I'm going to go back. Now we're flooding by dragging the logo in. I don't know if you guys can see it, but we're flooding it. There's actually shiny bits and non-shiny bits. Okay. So there's, can we paint it though? That's the big question. I think the answer to that question is yes. But we have to start filtering our layer stack. Right now we're looking at the base color values. If we were to look at roughness, okay. Let's add a black mask. And paint layer. I hit the wrong button. Let's see. Let's see if we do a small one. Coming out perfectly blue. So it is still, in fact, painting. Oops. Let's see, I'm not getting what I'm wanting because my brain is my brain's not working right now. Uh, maybe switch it to either a black or a white. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, on a fill layer, it's not giving me exactly what I was looking for. Um, here, let's go back to base color. Come on now. There we go. Now, one thing about these paint layers, okay, if you get a little sloppy as I have here, it's all good, right? So you can always go back in and erase it with just with some black pixels, right? If you only want one. Let's see, yeah, I really botched it over there, so I'll just get rid of all that stuff. All right, let's see if I can get that to just work inside of roughness. How I set this up may not work. I'm being too much of a control freak at the moment. Okay, cool. So, uh, let's see. Actually, I have some set up in here, and I think I've, I've messed it up. We'll save that part for another day, but you can paint in just roughness information and all that jazz as well. All right, because so I think I have to go in and... Well, I just figured it out. It's actually pretty easy. <laughs> um, these in here determine the role of this fill layer. So maybe I don't want this fill layer to influence the color, the height, the metallic, or the normal. So it's just feeding in roughness information. Of course, I painted it in on an area. Let's see. There it is. Yep. Can you guys see that? Yeah. See, it's just shiny on that one layer. There it is. Yep. Can you walk us through how you did that? Step one, sure. step two, step three. So really, I just painted it like any other layer, right? Let's just delete it. I'll make it just any color. It doesn't really matter at this point, right? Uh, let's mask it. 
And on that mask, we'll add a paint layer. And we'll start some good old projection painting. Now, I've already, it's saving, me, saving my last settings here. Let's go paint a version of my logo. There it is. Okay. I'm going to go back to my brush and clean up my mask a little bit because it got, obviously, very, very sloppy. All right, so there's my logo, right? But this particular layer, I don't want to influence color. I just want it to influence roughness, right? So if you go back into your layer stack, click on this guy. Now we're affecting the fill layers. We want this fill layer to not really focus on color. Turn it off. Don't want it to do height. And we don't want it to influence the metallic or the normal information of my stack. Oh, you put those buttons in. Off. Yep, turns them off. Turns off the roll of that part of the layer. Okay, so now that this layer is only influencing the roughness. Now it's kind of hard, if not impossible, to see at the moment. Let's see. So let's yeah, we gotta adjust our slider. Okay, I'm gonna put it all the way down. So where I painted white is gonna be pure reflective, and it is. Or, let's see what it looks like if we go the other direction. Yeah, now it's going to be pure matte. So right there in the, in the middle of the specular highlight, it's not reflective at all. Okay. And that's all thanks to the mask. Okay. Now this is going to be incorporated into, into the entire layer stack itself. So I'll just call this layer roughness, logo roughness. I want to add a paint layer below it. Okay. See how it doesn't go away? If I make this blue or purple, you can still see the role of that roughness layer inside of my inside of my stack, which is pretty cool. Now I've covered up my SEC logo, so just a reordering of my layers here will give me what I want. So this is the base color, this is the logo, and this is the logo's roughness. There it is. There's the logo. Those are some awesome colors, by the way. And it all is still editable across the entire, the entire gamut, which is really what I'm most attracted to. This is a very extensible texture set. I can make a change, uh, you know, whatever I want. Because sometimes you're going to want to make changes even for your own kind of art production pipeline. I've done this a couple times where I brought my textures over to Modo. You'll see this in Unity very directly here. And then you'll start putting the lights in there and you go, oh man, just the color shift is not what I want it to be. Like Moto eats color big time. Um, so if you want really bright, vibrant, saturated colors, nine times out of 10, the easiest way to do that is to oversaturate your textures. Because uh, the Moto rendering engine, it just eats color. It really does. Everything, even with a, a, even with a very saturated light, um, yeah, it, it, it eats up color pretty quickly. Um, so a small tweak here will influence what we, what we have over in Moda. So it's good to be able to make these changes. All right, questions on this? Cool, right? Very, very helpful. Yeah. Now, when you get more, more complex or into more complex texture sets, you're going to find that uh, um, things can change pretty quickly. Oops, what am I doing here? For example, Let's see, do I have it with me? Yeah, like here is one of the textures that I put, one of the stickers I made for my B17. I thought I had my much larger uh, decal sheet with me, but I don't think it's on this machine. Make sure it's not in here. No, it must not have been in this in this instance of uh, of my project file. Uh, but you can have, you know, one of the things that a lot of folks do, myself included, is you'll have a really big decal sheet, 
So if you know if you're gonna have like a whole bunch of logos on your on your on your B17, for example, you can put all that stuff on one decal sheet, import it in, and then you can just paint the areas of your decal sheet that you want. It's pretty neat. Um, yeah, if you look at the final render of this. I did all this in Substance Painter. Um, you know, that's a decal. That was its own decal. But if you look here, that's its own decal sheet. Or, you know, all of this stuff was on one decal sheet, right? And then I brought that one decal sheet in and I started masking. They're all black and white. And then I was able to go in and kind of art direct the colors as I went. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, I'm confused about the decaling part. I get how a decal can work. It, you know, make the decal, but when you make the background a solid color, doesn't that just destroy the decal? Because then it would just be a square. There's nothing, nothing would be well, on remember, it. you're masking. You're masking with the decal. That's the, that's the magic behind all of this, right? Is that this is your decal, right? This thing right here. It's a black and white image. So we're working inside of that mask system to mask a fill layer, right? So really, that entire fill layer gets you know kind of shaved down into just the size of your SCC logo. So you're never going to see the boundaries of that square. It's not like you're just taking a stamp and stamping it down. That masking engine, wherever it sees black, it's going to be transparent. Wherever it sees white, it's going to be opaque. Oh. Yeah. Or the reverse is not a white layer. Correct. Absolutely. Can you create uh, your decal uh, in Illustrator instead of Photoshop? Absolutely. Yeah, you can the, the creation of, of those decals, you can use whatever app you want. Eventually it's gonna get baked down into um, sort of some sort of pixel based format. TIFF, Targa, PNG. Never do JPEG because they're pretty heavily compressed. Um, I think in the most current version, it'll uh, and remember we're working on the old version, right? The, the most current version, I believe, it can take an SVG too. So, yeah, it's pretty good. All right, other questions, comments? Everyone good? Feeling it? Yeah? All right. Let's take a break because we've been going for about an hour and a half.
Oh crap. So while you guys are out on break, I just changed a few things to try to get a little bit of a stronger example of what this next part's all about. So I just applied a very quick material. I kept my logo in there. I changed the color a little bit. It's really easy to do considering our, our non-destructive mask-based workflow. But now I want to go in and start adding some micro details, some small little subtle additions to our texture set that will really start to make this, you know, kind of wrap it all together. And specifically, I want to add screw heads. Cool, right? Because if you think of it as a crate, there's going to be screw heads all over this thing. Is this something we want to model? No, right? This is a small little itty bit of detail. So this is excellent for a texture, right? However, there's a couple things we should look to do in here. Because if you think about a screw head, depending on how we engineer it, there needs to be some relief in there, right? The screw head's going to go into an opening, or maybe actually see the shadow catch in the opening of the screw head. There's some information in here that could be really impactful for us, okay? But this is now entering the world of height maps, okay? Height maps. It's kind of a it's kind of a real-time version of bump maps. Okay, it's an illusion, it's an illusion of shadows and highlights inside the texture itself, and they're really neat. Okay, and the in, and the implementation and all the substance products are really quite good. Okay, um, this isn't something we want to model geometrically, but it's something we can very quickly go in and add uh, here inside inside of Painter. Okay, so let's go ahead and start looking at it. If you look at the at the uh, the layer stack, what I have here, this is just a base smart material. I duplicated it and I masked it off. Okay, I made the base color of my of this red, and then I masked it off with my projection painting, the stencil. So now I basically have blue metal, red metal that's exclusively in the shape of my of my SEC logo. You can look real carefully. You can see, yeah, that's a good representative shot there. You can see the the purpose of that of that metal material. The roughness really makes it feel like it's something more than just, just kind of plastic. Okay, so I want to go in and start adding some screw heads into the mix here. Okay, now this is going to add, allow us to experiment and explore and kind of get real good at working with height maps. And like other map types inside of Substance Painter, it's really easy to create, but there are some considerations that we need to be mindful of as we, as we start to pipe them into our system here. Okay, now on the surface, ultimately what we're doing Let's just get rid of layer two, okay? On the surface, what we're doing, I'm gonna add standard paint layer in here, okay? Is that we're painting uh, kind of screen space, or we can even use projections if we wanted, like our stencils, uh, screen space information that the rendering engine is, is uh, using to determine height, okay? Now I've gone ahead, let me redo it so you guys can see it. I went ahead and I turned off color because I don't want to paint color information, right? Just want to do height and normal, okay? Now height, this is very, very similar to that of a bump map, okay? With the idea that we're working inside of a grayscale space. Where it's white, we create highlights. Where it's dark, we create shadows. In actuality, what we're doing is that we're using this number slider down here to determine the height, okay? Zero is no height, right? Positive value is going to bump up, okay? And negative value is going to bump down, okay? Real easy. Pretty powerful. Normal is a little bit different. We'll talk about normal maps and how we can paint normal information in the future. Theoretically, it's the exact same idea, but we don't get to control the relative height of the normals that we paint down. Normals, normal maps come from geometry. So the height of the geometry, uh, it determines how much it's bumped up and down inside of our texture map. So we're just going to work on height today because it gives us the most flexibility and it's the easiest way to kind of enter into this world. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to turn off normal. Since the height channel works off of a grayscale color spectrum, so black and white, we need to load in uh, some grayscale images. And what I'm going to do here is that under my brushes, okay, so this is my, excuse me. So I'm in my brush section, okay. You're more than welcome to do this in the stencil as well, but here's kind of a cool thing. I want to be able to go in and very quickly like stamp down with my brush some unique shapes, okay? So I'm in my brush section now. If I scroll down a little bit, there's this alpha section. And I want to load in a black and white image into this alpha section of my brush. It has to be black and white. 
FYI, I've gone over to the procedural section of my library, which is going to give us almost all black and white images, and uh, they're images that we get to control. And I think just for starters, I'm going to use this polygon. Okay, so I'm going to left click and drag it into my alpha section. And you can see that we have some, some things that we get to control in here. Like maybe we want it to be, I don't know, like an octagon or something. Pat, yes. the image you load in, is it already black and white? Or this is already black and white, yeah. It needs to be a black and white image. So, uh, now that I've loaded my brush with this alpha, okay, I can start going in and painting height information. Now, I'm going to go back down to my material section, and I need you to be very mindful of where this slider currently resides. Because on a standard paint layer, the value that it sits on while we're painting determines the height information that we're actually applying into the paint layer. So notice that mine's at zero. Given what we previously said, at a value of zero, what kind of height information are we going to get? None. So if I just stroke into my scene here, is it doing anything? Not actually, it's doing something very little, because I don't think I'm at perfect zero. However, if we change this, and let's just make it real extreme, 0.4, okay? Now we're bumping out. You can see what we're getting, okay? And if we zoom around inside of our scene here, you can see once we get over here, the illusion kind of breaks down a little bit. So it's a glorified, it's a glorified bump map, but it works really well. Here's a great little trick, by the way. If you hold down the shift key and drag with your right mouse button, you change the orientation of your environment. You can kind of get a good preview of what that illusion looks like. You're just spinning your environment. That's all you're doing. Wait, let me see the side view. Yeah, yeah see how you look at it from the side? It kind of breaks oh, down pretty wow. quickly. Wait, but from the fifth, shift okay. right mouse button and drag. I've been betrayed. Yeah, so this is absolutely a trick, okay? In the modern real time architecture, this is something that you see all the time, right? Uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty prevalent out there. Now, when you're bumping out, the illusion breaks down pretty quickly, right? But when we're bumping in, okay, check it out. And once again, I'm going to return this. Let's do it to like 0 0.6, negative 0 0.6. Now, I'm bumping in, okay? So when we bump in, it's not as noticeable because when we get over here, your brain kind of says, oh, well, it's supposed to be a recess inside of, our, inside of the shape. Maybe I'm not catching all the information that I need to. It kind of it's a little bit easier for the illusion to continue, uh, you know, when we're when we're doing negative values. And that's not to say that we can't do both. Okay. So that's height map stuff. It's a whole lot of fun. However, and this is my big struggle with it. I don't like these paint layers. I think they're absolutely useless because I want to be able to go in and control this after the fact. With the paint layers, it's fire and forget. Whatever the settings are inside of your properties panels determines what gets stroked down. So I, point being, I can't go in and change the height of these now, right? Because whatever the properties were when I hit the stroke, whenever you know whatever this height value was when I left clicked and dragged, that's what gets put onto the layer, right? It's not editable after the fact. So let's explore this a little bit more directly and see how we can work with this exact same idea but in a non-destructive, editable fashion. What do you think I'm going to make here? Fill a fill layer. Yeah, it all begins with the fill layer. That in my, what's next after that? Mask. That we're going to mask. Okay. So let's make a fill layer. Much like we did earlier. Okay. Turn off color, roughness, normal, all that jazz. I just want height. Okay. And of course, I want to add a black mask. Naturally, I'll add a paint layer to that mask. And now I'm in that exact same workflow, right? Let's load in that polygon over there. Let's see, in my pattern, I think I had an eight-sider. Let's do that octagon, so it really is the same. And now what we're getting, I'm going to make this a little bigger. Usually at this point, people start to freak out, right? Because I've just clicked four times, and we don't see anything. However, if we were to hold down the option key and look at the contents of my mask, I did do something, right? But keep in mind what it is that we're working with here. We're working with a fill layer that's being masked out. The only thing that I've done is paint white pixels in the shape of an octagon on my mask. If I wanted to affect the height, 
return to my fill layer. Okay, with my fill layer selected, check it out, my height value is at zero. Okay, watch what happens when I start dragging this up and down. There they go up, and then they go down. Okay, now I get to really control this after the fact. Okay, that's pretty cool. There they go. Pretty neat. Okay. These brushes are pretty neat. There's some fun things that we can do with these brushes, you know, quickly inside uh, inside of Painter. Of course, we can go in and maybe we want to add, I don't know, like a whole bunch of rivets on this. Okay. We'll do the screws in a second because that's, that's kind of fun. Maybe we want to have a whole bunch of rivets. Okay. Let's clear my black mask. I'm going to clear the mask. I'm not deleting it. Add my paint layer back in. Okay. All right. So, I believe, where is it? I'm in the procedural section. It used to be. Here, we'll do this. Instead of using an alpha, I'm going to clear my alpha. Um, I'm just going to use a different brush. Because our brushes are pretty fun. I'm just going to use the hard, hard edge brush, default hard brush. Now, the reason I'm going to do this, check this out, this is pretty neat. Okay. I want to make a whole bunch of rivets that go like in a board. Now, remember, I'm painting on height information. I'm a height. I don't know, my height value is at, I don't know, 0.5 or so. Check it out. Of course, if I click, hold on the shift key, you can paint a straight line. Okay, that's really neat. Okay, I like that. Click, hold on the shift key. Oop. That's cool. That's cool, right? But we can do better than that. I want a whole row of rivets. Okay, check it out. If we go in, into our brush properties, this is actually neat. Actually, left click and drag in here and get a preview of what the stroke is actually going to look like. Now, what I want to do is that I want to increase the spacing so that when I click, it doesn't stamp down a circle. That's really what it's doing when you're clicking and dragging. It's just taking like a, a stamp. Okay, you guys, you ever played bingo before? Yeah. You get the bingo cards, you get the big rubber stamp thing, right? You know, you're stamping down on the bingo card. That's kind of what our brush is doing. It's going stamp. Stamp, stamp, but it's doing stamp, do, 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 a whole bunch of stamps in a very small amount of time. So the appearance is a, is, is a solid line. There's actually just a circle being stamped down a lot. Well, by increasing the spacing, I can get a whole series of sequential dots. Okay. And in turn, click, hold down shift, pull out a tail. Bloop. I got me some rivets. They're all evenly spaced out. Okay. I can continue doing that. So that might be better than just doing it in Moto. This is absolutely better than doing it in Moto. Because geometrically, you wouldn't want to do this over in Moto. Just add a bunch of 3D rivets in there. Yeah, that's a detail that's not necessary. And that's looking pretty great from in here. Yeah? Did you say hold on to shift and drag? Yeah, so. Check it out. So you can click once, uh -huh. click, hold down shift, like immediately after. And you drag out a little tail. Now I'm going to be painting that stroke in a straight line. Okay. So how do you change the color? Well, at the moment, and that's a good question. At the moment, what I'm doing here, go back to my fill layer that I'm masking out. That's all I'm doing is just masking the fill layer, right? At the moment, if we look at its properties, I'm just affecting the height channels and Again, this kind of speaks to our non-destructive nature. I can make them just very tiny, teeny rivets or make them really extreme. You know, we're in control of that, right? Or I can say maybe they're undulations that go in. That's cool too, right? We can art direct up, you know, on the fly. If I wanted to make it a color, right, just turn the color value back on and they're there, okay? And then maybe make it, well, you know, anything we want or can make it red for all I care. Or here's the kind of the cool thing about this is um, now it's let's 
go into our materials. Maybe it is copper. We can drag it into the base color. Okay. Or let's drag it into the material slot. I'm sorry. Yeah. Now it nuked all my height in height information because for this material, the height channel's turned off. That's okay. I can turn it back on. Bring it back out again. And now they're kind of coppery. Yeah, all these material presets come with predefined preset material characteristics. So depending on what you're doing, you may have to re-enable this to activate the height channels and you're on your way. It's pretty cool. Yeah, go ahead. So say if I want to create a, um, a box with like a space popping out of it, would I just create a black and white? So I would say, you know, we can't make it a flat surface into a three-dimensional shape. This is truly a trick, right? This is a camera trick. This is the rendering engine looking at these grayscale values and saying highlights and shadows, right? That's all it's really doing. Um, this is not like a displacement map that we have over in Moto, where it's physically transforming the geometry and the, the points on our, on our surface uh, into that shape. That's not what this is, um, although that is a function of our rendering our real-time rendering engines, that level of displacement. Um, yeah. So I don't know if you get like a nose, you know. <laughs> this is for like little things, like little surface details. In the context of your treasure chest, a lot of uh, you know, if you have like a, a you know some sort of I don't know, like a, a you know a brass piece on your treasure chest that has some really ornate detail, that's height map information stuff. You can go in and paint that stuff in pretty quickly. Okay. And you can be as creative in this as you'd like too, right? Um, you know, as an example. I think I'm, I'm going to look at the top of the bottom here. There we go. There we go. Let's get into orthographic views. There we go. You know, for example, you certainly could go in and uh, return to your to your masks. And this is why this non-destructive masking workflow is so cool, right? Because in every sense, this mask is for the rivets. Well, I could absolutely go in and add another paint layer right to that mask okay and on this one uh, maybe what I'm trying to establish here is like I don't know a big brass or in this case like a copper kind of panel okay I forgot to do my spacing I'm sorry okay And you can go in and, and add more interior detail in there as well. Mm. Okay, so you can really go in and, and and super texture this the way you want. One thing, and I forgot. I'm sorry, Grant. Let me just finish the thought. Someone asked this last week, and I wanted to make sure I touched on it. Okay. Someone said, "Can you work in symmetry?" And the answer is absolutely. Okay. Symmetry inside of Substance Painter is really really easy to establish is these tools up here. These are our symmetry tools. Okay, So we can turn the symmetry tool on and then select the, the pane of symmetry. And like for me, I want to do symmetry along the Y. Okay, The little red line determines the, uh, the axis of symmetry. Now, very similar to what I had before, we can go and make these little thingamajigs here these detail pieces, whatever they may be. What I got in the bottom, I also got the top. Okay, so it is doing it in symmetry. It's painting this information symmetrically. Okay, that's a pretty neat, pretty neat thing for us. Now, okay, so what's cool about working in height maps is that of course, naturally, we can have these height values go any which way we want, right? With this, this one master slider down here in the fill layer properties. But what if, and this is where it gets kind of, kind of fun, what if I wanted to have this thing and then another height layer inside of it, like a little scribble detail or something that says like Pat's rad or a big thumbs up on the inside of my little copper plaque on the inside, right? Well, now I need an additional additional fill layer, an additional layer. 
because we can't have multiple heights on one layer, right? So you have to now start thinking in, in relief dimension now. Let's add another fill layer in. And on this one, I'm going to turn off color, uh, roughness, metal, normal. So it's just grabbing height information. And of course, let's mask it and add in our paint layer. Okay. It's way too big. And this is just proof of concept, just so we can keep going here. Okay. Oops, I forgot to change my height value. That would have visually not done a single thing. Let's see if I can do this. Doing this with the mouse too, which is never <laughs> encouraged. Because that's awesome, isn't it? I did such a good job at that. <laughs> Point being is that we ha now have different height layers where we can begin to simulate different height layers inside of one inside of one thing. I could, yeah, if I wanted to, that little thing, I don't know why I'd want to in this particular situation, because I did such a good job at painting it, but, yeah, that's what I just did. So, if I wanted to, let's just finish the illusion here. Here we go. That's pretty cool. Different height. So I can actually pop it out some, so if you look very carefully... Down over here, it looks, and I'm going to shift, grab my right, right mouse button and drag. Yeah, it looks like it dips down, flattens out, and then it kind of pops back out a little bit, a little bit. Okay. These are really great for small, small, subtle little details. And of course, I was doing it in the bottom and the top at the same time because my symmetry was on. Okay. What do you mean the edge? Like, I don't think I quite follow. Like, like down this edge here. Yeah, we certainly could go in and paint it. Okay. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Let's see if I go back to this one. Let's see if we can do it real fast. Yeah, there's that way. I'm not doing a super great job here, but proof of concept. Is snapping? I'm snapping my camera. Yeah, I didn't do a very good job. So I rotate around, hold on the shift key, boop, snaps in. Not really, no. Where's the symmetry button? This guy right here. This turns on your plane of symmetry. And then you can determine which axis of symmetry right here. Yeah. Uh, what if you want to do an effect, not like a bump, but more like a displacement? Can't do that here. Uh, yeah. That's not what this is. Yep. You can do that in the real-time workflow. That's available to us. That's just not what this is. It does. You know, there's a lot of details out there that you can achieve through texture information. Okay, we don't have to model everything. Not everything has to be a texture or a geometry. There's a lot of, I always think, you know, in the terms of if I can get away with it with the texture first, I'm going to do that, right? Um, and then if I need it to be geometry at the shot or if the moment calls for geometry, then I go back in and that, that starts a new conversation, right? Because textures are incredibly efficient. Geometry, not so much. Yeah. All right. So big picture here. Uh, we've done some awesome work. Now we need to get it out of substance and into Moto, right? And that export from substance is really quite easy, okay? Now last week, or when we tried to do this the, the first time, we ran into a big time problem, okay? And these machines, they're frozen, okay? Which is why whenever the machines restart, they kind of get returned back to their original configuration. And in freezing, in finger quotes, the machines, um, they've locked down access to a number of the uh, shelf folders that allow us to make these presets, okay? These export presets. Um, 
I went ahead and placed all of the, the Moto Export presets in the correct location. I had the computer services guys come in. We, un, we thawed all the machines. And yes, actually, that's the physical terminology. We thawed the machines. We changed the files, and we froze them again. <laughs> um, so this export preset will be on these machines and in the machines over in the design lab. However, at home, you're going to need to make this export preset. Okay. If you go into Canvas, I've given you a video that talks very directly about how to make this export preset. It is this one right here. Check it out. It's in the week seven bundle. Okay, this guy. Go watch this video. It's not hard. It really isn't. And everything that you're about to interface with here in the lab uh, is a duplication of that process. Okay. So I'm ready to get rid of my texture, get it out of Moto or out of Substance Painter and over into a system that Moto can adopt. Okay. So let's do it real fast. It's really quite easy. Naturally, you're going to want to save your project first. That's great. Okay. So it's saving the, the SP, SPP project file. Now that we have a whole bunch of stuff in here, a lot of layers, those mesh maps that we used, that we baked at the beginning, this SPP project file can be quite big. Let's see, at the moment it's what? 154 megabytes, okay? No joke, I have uh, on my laptop, shoot, on this machine, I think I have uh, painter project files that are like almost three gigs. So they can get big. They can get big real quick, okay? Just manage that. That's part of, you know, the media management. They can get large, okay? Lean into that idea, okay? Um, this, okay, is not what we're bringing over into Moto. This is not at all what we want to have in Moto. What Moto wants and will accept are just standard image maps. So we have to extract all the different shader channels from our sub Substance Painter project file and basically create a whole series of image maps that Moto can accept. At the end of the day, and I have an example here for you, this is ultimately what we're after. Here's one for the propeller of my B17. This is what we're getting. Okay, a diffuse map, that's what it looks like. This particular one didn't have much diffuse, actually. Let's try something else, because there should be diffuse information. There we go. All right, here's the main body of my of my B17. Okay, so this is what a diffuse map looks like, just the basic color of everything. We're also going to be creating a normal map, okay, which has a lot of the height information in there. You can see from the way I've created my height information, these, these are actually 4K or 8K. I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can see the benefit of of these normal maps. This is how I created all the rivets and stuff on my B17. Works really well. The illusion was pretty solid. Okay. Roughness. Of course, the specular amount. This is how shiny and where the shiny bits are going to be. Okay. And last but not least, the specular color. Where it's shiny, well, what color is that going to be? All right. And we're also going to export out in the ambient occlusion map. Now this one we can use or not use. It's up to us in our creative process. I'll show you the benefits of working with that here in a minute. But let's look at how to get this stuff out. It's really easy. If we cruise back over into, into Painter, once we save our project file, file at the very bottom here, export textures. Okay, You'll get a little popover that asks for a couple things specifically. We're going to start, away, start at the top, work our way down to the bottom. So you need to know where you save this, okay? I don't know where your project files are, okay? You have to tell the computer exactly where to save all this. Uh, I'm going to put mine on the desktop. Since I'm going to be pumping out a whole bunch of files, it makes sense that we put it all into a folder. Okay. So this is the, the location that we're going to be saving the files. This is the type of file, the format of the file that we're going to be creating, PNGs. I like PNGs. However, you know, there's a huge long list of files in here. Some of these, I like, I don't even know what they are. Like PPM, no idea what a PPM file is. I'm sure there's a function out there for, I just don't know what it is. PNGs, TIFFs, Targas, those, those are really great landing spots for this type of work that we're going to be doing. So I like PNGs. 
This is the bit depth, okay? For 99.98% of the things that you're gonna be doing, you just need eight bits. I don't think we're at 16-bit uh, textures for real time. It's how many colors are available. Yeah, 16 bits. Now we're talking into the you know, trillions of colors that are available for us to draw in. Um, we're not there. We're not at a rendering level in the real-time space. If you're doing high, high, if you're working on The Last Jedi, then you're going to be making like 16-bit images because the amount of data that they're going to be pumping in through their frames is intense, right? So point being, if you don't need 16 bits, just leave it at 8. I think I've made like a handful of 16-bit images in my, in my life. So they're just not something I, you, you really run across. Why do you have to refer to pixel size or how many pixels can be on the screen? More colors. Yeah, more color. All right, and then here's the most important part, the configuration file. This is how it's going to be exported out of the application. Okay. Now there's a bunch of presets. I added the Moto PBR preset in there for you guys. Okay. At home, you're going to need to create this, and there's a video that tells you how to create this. This preset should be available to you in the lab as well. So we're going to click on it. Okay. And what this actually does, if you want to see the behind the scenes of all of this, go into your configuration tab. And there it is, Moto PBR. This will tell you exactly what the preset's doing. Okay, so I'll let you guys explore this on your own. Unfortunately, you can't make a new one. You really can't delete it because it's all locked down and it's going to crash. This is why I <laughs> saved my project file. This is exactly why I saved my project file. Oh, good, it didn't crash. Great. So I'm going to use the Moto PBR preset. Okay, and this next step, the dilation. Don't worry about this. Just leave it as is, okay? Um, for most of the things that we're doing in here, you can just leave this at the default. What this is, is effectively uh, handling here, and I'll show you an example. Okay, so here is the texture for my, my airplane. Okay. See all this jazz in here? I didn't paint that. That's the dilation. That's the computer taking uh, the edge pixel and repeating it within a certain range from the edge of the boundary. Don't worry about this. This is, this is a computer-driven event, okay? It's, you're never going to see it, okay? If your UVs don't change, you're never going to see this. It ensures that we don't accidentally see white pixels or transparent pixels or black pixels in the actual texture itself. That at the very least, along the borders of all of our UVs, we're repeating the last pixel color in the row, okay? So, for example, if the background of my texture here was white, um, this padding ensures that we don't actually see white, okay? Like I said, it's just leave it at the defaults. It's, it's, it's designed to be your safety net, okay? All right, and this is physically what's getting exported out. This is the texture set. Here's the resolution, so we're creating a 2K texture set. And that's all we need to do is hit export, boom, on our way. It doesn't take very long. Yeah? Um, does it also, wait, does it exclude hidden layers? Well, there are no hidden layers in Substance Paint. No, and like, like, if you, like, say, make a really blue layer and then disable it, as in, like, hide it, like, does it export it? Uh, no, so that's a good question. So really what the question was, uh, Really, the answer to the question, I apologize, is, is it's going to export the current state of your layers palette. Mm -hmm. So if you've turned things off, that's not going to be exported. Yeah. All right. So, yay, you did it, right? Let's open up the folders, do a good discount, double check. Okay. Here are the five textures that have pumped out. Okay. Diffuse, normal, roughness, spec amount, and spec color. Okay. I always like to look at them real fast, make sure that it, it did, in fact, do everything that I want it to do. And uh, I think I'm a happy camper. Yeah, I see lots of blue and red. There's my normals. You can see all my little faux rivets, rivets in here, which is fun. There's the roughness. Here's spec amount and then spec color. Okay, cool. It worked. Back to Moto. Let's get this up and running back over here. So...
Okay, so I'm going to open up my crate. All right, so here's that exact same crate that we were working on in Substance Painter. It's back in here in Moto. Ha ha! Awesome, right? Now it's time to get in, now it's time to get our material set up in here in Moto working the way we want it to work. Okay. So the first thing that we need to do is that on yours, on this particular one, I don't have a material assigned to all the polygons, so I need to go back in and do that real fast. And luckily for us, just middle mouse, drag out a window selection, hit the M key. Um, and we'll call this crate. All right. Should that be something that you do before all this? Or? Yeah. In, in, in most scenarios, this is going to be done before you even export. I'm just working off an FBX file. I don't, I don't have the LXO for this particular piece with me. All right. So one material, and all, the, all five of those materials are going to be, or excuse me, all five of the textures that I just exported from, from Substance are going to be placed in this one material group. Okay. Now there's a number of different ways that we can do this. I'm I'm all about making it easy. Okay. Here they all are. Okay. I'm gonna leave the AO for the moment. I'm gonna go diffuse all the way down to spec color. So I'm gonna grab all five of those. And I'm simply just gonna left click and drag them into that material group. It really is that easy if we allow it to be. Yeah. Why are we leaving that one up? This is the AO you don't necessarily need. It's more of a personal choice. This is gonna make the shadows a little bit darker. I'll put it in a, in a second. It's not required, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. What'd you click on? Import? Uh, I haven't imported anything yet. I'm just in the Finder app at the moment. Uh -huh. And now I'm just going to left click and drag that into my material. Bloop. There they all go. Okay. Now don't freak out. A lot of folks at this moment, they freak out. Because they start looking at what they see inside the OpenGL viewport. And they go, Pat, this looks nothing like the way it looked over inside of Substance. And I go, you're absolutely right, because you are exactly 10% done <laughs> in this process. There's a number of steps that we need to continue to refine and to, uh, to finish out to get the illusion the way we want it to look. Okay? Okay. So there's really two additional steps here, excuse me, three additional steps here that we need to follow. First and foremost, the, the, the first step is UVs. We need to make sure that all of these imported image maps are using the correct UV map. At times, Modo can pick and choose the wrong one and may not get it right. So let's make sure that all of them are being uh, piped into the exact same UV. I have all five of them selected. And downstairs in my Properties tab, I need to look at the Texture Locator. Okay, so here's the Texture Locator. And specifically, there it is. Okay, good. Whew. It's using the right one. Good job. Okay, you gotta double check this because sometimes if you have multiple objects in your scene, uh, it'll pick and choose the UV map. Okay, so step one: make sure that the UVs or each texture okay. is being assigned to the correct UV coordinate information. That's step one. Step two is that we gotta make sure that the color space for each one of these textures is dialed. Okay, and correct. I'm gonna expand this a little bit. And of course, my naming convention is way long. All right. So we have the diffuse, the normal map, the roughness, the spec amount, and spec color. Now we need to make sure that the color space for all five of these material, all five of these textures, is correct. Okay. It's really easy to do. Um, the ones that have color information, so the diffuse color and the specular color, you can do both of them at the same time, which is what I normally do. Okay. The two that have color information on it need to have, if you go into the image still section, this guy, color space. We want the texture maps that have color information exclusively to use the sRGB color space. Hold on. Okay, so go to the image still selection and do what? Change the color space to sRGB. And it's this parameter right here. FYI, just so everyone's on the same page, and I love that people are feverishly writing notes. Awesome. I am live streaming this, by the way. And this entire process is duplicated in the video that I linked to inside of the week seven can uh, section on Canvas. So you'll see you know, the community manager, you know, his name's Wes McDermott. 
He's a cool guy. He's a longtime moto guy. I actually know him. He's a pretty neat dude, right? He walks you through this entire process back in moto, too. Wes is actually an old school moto dude, right? He's one of the original moto artists, right? Um, so he does a great job of kind of doing this exact same thing. So there are multiple, multiple uh, access points to this information. I think that's what I'm trying to say. All right. So the color ones, diffuse and spec color, those get set to sRGB. Now, the roughness, the roughness and the specular whites, these are grayscale images, okay? They determine how shiny, uh, or, excuse me, uh, how rough our surface is and how shiny our surface is, okay? So they don't have any color information on them, they're just grayscale. So these two, roughness and spec amount, their color space gets set to linear to preserve 100% of their grayscale color spectrum, right? Because what these cold color profiles do, just so everyone's hip and in the know here, <laughs> they compress colors out of their function, right? I wish I had my gigantic whiteboard to illustrate this, but imagine our color spectrum looks like this, it's a straight line, okay? And actually chart colors like this instead of the 3D space. Of course, my marker is going to die. Yeah. But within a linear color space, each value is weighted according to the numer their numerical you know, input value, right? However, you know, we have a number of different color profiles which compress, which changes, it kind of weights the color values a little bit differently. And I don't know what the actual color profile looks like for sRGB, so this is in every sense a visualization. But garbage marker. Let's try it again. Something like that. So there's a knee and a shoulder inside the color profile. Okay, compresses the information. Now the whites a little bit more contrasty up at the tops and at the bottoms. Okay. These are color profiles. That's what they're doing. They're determining how the colors are represented digitally inside of their own unique color spectrum. For the roughness and the specular amount, we want to use a linear color profile. The color ones, we want to use the sRGB color profile, right? And, S and the sRGB is the color profile of our computer screens, okay? Last but not least, normal map. This one. We want to put its color space to none. We don't want any color information applied to this, right? We just want it, we want the computer to read the raw data that's come right out of substance, okay? We don't want to apply any sort of weighting to the color space into our into our image. So just use color space and none. Okay. So step one is making sure that all th all five of these are being piped to the correct UV map. Step two is to go in and change the color space for each one of these. The two, the diffuse and spec color, the two image map that handle color information get set to sRGB. Roughness and spec amount, since they're grayscale images, get set to linear. And the normal map gets set to none. Step four, and this is the fourth, or step three, this is the third and final step in this process, is to change the role of all of these images inside of the material. Because right now, if you look at the effects, they're all set to what? Diffuse color, which is what we want, right? This is the easy part, okay? So this is diffuse, is going to be diffuse, okay? Normal, okay, we don't want the normal map to be influencing the diffuse color channel of the moto material, right? So if we click on it, it's under surface shading, normal. Roughness is under basic channels. Roughness, spec amount is also under basic channels, and last but not least, spec color, as one might imagine, is also in basic channels. One thing, and I've done this more times than I probably should admit, uh, there is a difference between specular color and subsurface color. I can't tell you how many times I've boo-booed and I've made a mistake and I've accidentally chosen subsurface color instead of specular color. 
these so things happen. These things happen. The these things happen, and when it's 3 a.m., you're like, oh, my gosh, I just want this to be done, right? That's just exactly me. What I just said you. Yeah, right? <laughs> so just be aware. Specular color. Specular color. All right. Now our image setup is complete. However, don't judge it by what you see in this viewport. This is the advanced GL viewport. We're not seeing all the rendering effects in here. Okay? The advanced GL viewport is just going to give us a basic kind of approximation as to what this looks like to really get a good solid understanding of how this reads inside of our 3D space. Let's look at the render. Yeah, and it's starting to look a little bit better. Well, you would definitely see the power, the material, that little brass or uh, copper material I put down. You can see everything nice and shiny. It's usually at this point, some people start to panic. Okay, They say, once again, Pat, this looks nothing like the way it looked over in Substance Painter. And I say, well, there's two reasons why it's going to look nothing like it looked over in Substance Painter. And I can see this on Josh's. I'm not outing yours, but his is a great, great example. If you look at Josh's screen, his treasure chest Super crunchy. The darks are super dark, right? The preview window also has a color profile, and you'll probably want to change this dark. All right, Josh, excuse me. The lookup table, this is a color profile. Is yours set to none, Josh? It's set to none. It's set to none. Change it to sRGB. You're going to get a little bit more of a, a representative illustration of what it actually is going to look at, re at render. So make sure your lookup table, your color profile for the render, is set to sRGB. Okay? In addition, and I think I mentioned this last time, but it's really important, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important to be aware of. Look at the background of our Moto environment. What is it? It's gray. Okay. Go back over here into Substance Painter. Is it gray? No, it's not gray. And let's, let's check it out. Uh, let's see. Where is it? And I always forget where it is. So display settings, you can actually... Where is it? Center viewer settings, environment. Ah, it's right in front of me. Environment opacity. Okay, right now it's set to zero. We don't see the environment, but there is actually a background environment inside a substance that's kind of changing our understanding of the colors that we're producing. Okay, we put it at 100. There it is. There's the actual background, and it's being blurred quite significantly. Okay, so our background that my little my little uh, my little crates in is actually, you know, the hills are alive. It's in the mountains, right? Okay. So to really get an apples to apples comparison, we also need to make sure that the image that I'm using in the background here in Substance is being loaded into the background over in Moto, and then that way we really can get a good solid understanding if if things are working the way they want to work. Okay. Now, luckily for us, if you want to test this, okay, you can do that pretty quickly. Let's go into our shelf. There's a section here called environments. Okay. And I don't even remember what environment I have. Um, which one am I using? I don't know. I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Let's, uh, let's pick one here. Now we're in the ocean. That's fun. Bonifacio, how about in the forest? That's cool too. Let's just pick one. Corsica Beach. There's the shipyards. I really am shopping now. I shouldn't have done that. Okay, let's go with not that one. <laughs> sorry. Oh, that's it right there. Which one was that? I'm sorry, that's the one that we were using earlier. It was uh, just Panorama. Ah, so if you want to double check it, Right click on it, then export resource. Okay, that's basically just going to change the location of uh, of the file. Okay, we'll op open it up in that folder. Now, if we return to the folder that I just saved it, it's an EXR. Okay, that's the panorama photo that's being used in the background of Substance. I'm going to place this exact same image into the background of Moto. What if you use the Moto preset? Well, this is just a test, right? This is just, you don't have to do this. This is just a, just to make sure that it's looking the way it's supposed to look, okay? So in my environment here, add layer, image map, load it in. 
that guy. And now it's starting to look pretty similar. Yeah, pretty similar. Now the other thing that's also influencing this is our directional light. We don't have a directional light over inside of uh, Substance Painter. It's just using the environment to light our stuff. And now it's very, very similar. It's a little bit dark. I think the, the, uh, the uh, indirect intent, and our, our projector is making it dark too on my screen here. Yeah. Yeah, the intensity of our, uh, of our environment here is a little bit different than what it is over here. But the colors, the reflection colors are all the same. You know, if you wanted to go in and increase the, the role of your of your environment, you know, you just do, I don't know, let's just try 1.5. Yeah, now it's definitely much, much brighter. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. It's looking real good, actually. I'm pretty pleased with this. So that's the round trip. That's how we do it. Questions on this? And that's the whole idea. It's pretty neat, right? Very neat. It allows us to, you know, get to our end result much, 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 much faster. I'm a big fan of it, actually. I feel like there needs to be like a shortcut where you just have everything preset to what we normally do, and then just yeah, get you know, in there. me too. Ah, I I would love that. That's crazy. That that would be so really helpful. Be really helpful. It'd be cool to just be like import your your painter project file into Moto and just everything kind of pipe into the right places. If algorithmic's listening to my live stream, hint hint, nudge nudge. That'd be an excellent, <laughs> excellent addition to our workflow. Quick, everyone spam at algorithmic. <laughs> yeah, the great thing about it, army. yeah, right. The cool thing about algorithmic, and if you're going down to the game developers conference next week, I encourage you to stop by their booth, you know, uh, and check it out. You know, they're a pretty progressive company. Uh, I honestly think that more than most, they're really doing some some neat some neat things in our industry to make this pipeline a little bit easier. Um, yeah, I mean, has anyone ever made textures using the traditional kind of like Photoshop method? You haven't seen it. I have. It is a pain in the rear, right? Uh, yeah, it's it's not fun. Let's put it that way. So this makes it fun. And at the very least, I'm pretty excited that it's just fun again. All right, so your homework this week, okay, is to get your crate done. That is our exclusive assignment. Uh, as hopefully everyone has the geometry and the UVs finished, now it's time to kind of put our texturing hats on and get the textures done in Painter and then back over into Moto and rendered in Moto. So that's the expectation this week, and I'll, I'll pop the assignment sheet on here in a second. Yeah. Did you say crate or crate, uh, I'm sorry. I said crate. I meant treasure chest. I fall. I've been saying crate for the last three hours. That's probably what I'm going to say in the middle of my dreams tonight. Crate. Yeah. Everyone's going to be like, "Honey, who's this crate?" <laughs> um, so that's that's our that's our job this week is to finish the texture set and get it back over into Moto. Okay. I know I mentioned this before, but this really is a great resource. Okay. This is a good old Wes. Okay, and Wes talks very directly. Why is it not coming up? Is it coming up for you guys? Oh, I gotta click on the little button. That's thanks, Canvas. Okay, so Wes talks very directly on this entire export process. Okay, and it's a it's a good it's a good little video. I definitely suggest watching it eight or nine times until your ninja's at it. In addition, you also have the live streams that that I just did today as well. Okay. Questions, comments, concerns, everyone ready to rock and roll? Yeah, Frank. These computers run all these programs efficiently. What are the specs on these things? So, uh, I don't know. But I can tell you where to find out. I don't know. I've had some issues, especially with the... About this Mac? There it is. There's all the information you'll need on these machines. FYI, these are okay machines. These are yeah. not high-end machines at all. In any regard, these aren't high-end machines. How much do uh, they work each of them? So I have no idea. Buy, yeah. Um, I don't know. A lot. Yeah. We're, we're, we're thankful that school buys these machines for us. Bulk, apparently. In bulk. Yeah. So. Are they going to get you a uh, like an iMac Pro? You know, maybe. 
maybe. I've let's just say I've had the conversation with people. Yeah, but we'll see. Uh, there is one actually that uh, runs three is not really well, but it's like a trash can. <laughs> don't buy that one. Yeah, don't buy the Mac Pro because they're about to refresh it. Uh, okay. They're they, they, um, is that Apple's. The trash can? That's the trash can, that's yeah. Trash can. That's Darth Vader's Darth Vader's garbage can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's there's a big Apple event at the end of the month, and I'm really expecting Apple to not to release, but at least tell folks what the new Mac Pro is gonna look like. Uncharacteristically, Apple about a year and a half ago publicly came out and said, Yeah, we really kind of messed up the Mac Pro. Um, wow. Yeah, and you know, a lot of folks when it first came out, a lot of folks were really kind of unhappy with the Mac Pro, um, and uh, they said in that announcement, in that little press moment that they have, that they're going back to the drawing boards and they're going to be, you know, kind of embracing the idea of modularity, which is in the professional community something that you really need. Um, and I'm hoping we see a little vision of that at the Apple event at the end of the month. But that's just me. I've been waiting for waiting for that for a bit. So, all right, let's get to work.